So um, what we're going to do first is we're going to have each of the panelists say a little bit about their role and their job and you know, what really makes them tick. And uh, then we'll have a panel conversation. Then we'll open up for questions. OK? So you want to start us off? Sure. Great. Um, so again, I'm Sarah Peterson. So um, started my career, actually graduated from San Jose State with a business degree, never even knew what internal comms was. Um, and was, was at HP during the reinvention. So kind of just landed, and, and I was happy to have a job. Um, and worked in corporate communications there, worked on um, the HP Compact merger, and frankly was just a little uh, ready to do something new, and so went to Oracle. Um, and I think I was the only internal communicator there at, at the time um, in IT communications, and then came to Intuit very quickly after. Um, and I've worked in BU teams and in corporate, um, and now I'm in the technology communications group. Um, and recently we combined, so technology is everything from kind of IT to our innovation groups to engineering tools and services. Um, and over the last couple of months, and what we've seen kind of in, into it is this <coughs> shift to combine PR and internal comms. So we're organized where everything is under one group, all of those functions, but now they're joining teams. Um, and I think it's helpful for our leaders so they have kind of one person to coach them and you know, talk to and go to. They don't have to decide what team do they go to. Um, and it's provided uh, mobility for us. Um, and so we've had about three or four teams kind of make that shift. And then underneath us having specialists, either internal, with a lot of internal background. And for me, we just hired someone with a little bit more external to kind of bring that to our team. Um, and so that's kind of where I am today. I'm not a technologist, um, and I say that's what makes me good at my job because if technology people can't explain to me, then we can't explain to you know our customers or our employees. Um, so that's a bit about me. Thank you. I'm Francesca Carpell. Is this better? And <laughs> I've been with NetApp. It will be 14 years um, in November. And I started um, in internal comms um, at NetApp and really started my formal communications career there. I have a, an MBA in finance and a, a business background, but I've always liked to write and uh, have took some time off when my children were little and did some consulting, did some teaching, and discovered that most of what I was doing was around communications. So when I went back to work full time, I had a friend uh, who was a very, very humble person um, and actually um, really a great example of an executive at NetApp. I had no idea this person was one of the top eight or ten executives there. And she was coaching me on um, returning to full-time work and asked to take a look at my resume and said, you know, we'd be very interested in, uh, in having you come to NetApp. So I started off in internal comms. I was the first person that they had fill that role on a full-time basis and really have had a lot of fun growing the internal comms functions and capabilities of the company as the company and its needs have uh, changed, as we now have you know, more people in our India site than we had in the whole company when I joined, um, as we have communications experts in some of our functional groups and geo groups, uh, some focusing on internal comms on a full-time basis. So different challenges um, and different opportunities as the company has grown, um, and always the opportunity to grow with the company. One of our corporate values is adaptability, and that's something that we've done um, bringing in technology, bringing in programs, and then if they are no longer filling the need that we thought they should fill originally, then letting them go and finding out what we need to do today and moving forward. Okay. <laughs> Much like uh, Francesca, I was the first internal comms person at uh, VMware when they kind of started on their rocket ride back in the day. So uh, that was pretty exciting and fun. And about halfway through the interview, I was also running recruitment marketing. Uh, <laughs> they saw my marketing background. They're like, we don't have anyone doing that. We need that. We have like 3,000 people to hire this year. Can you, can you take that on as well? So I took that on, um, kind of started branching out into events with them as well and formed this very interesting hybrid role that um, I did there for over five years, which was really around using communication, marketing, and events to both attract amazing employees and excite and inspire the employees that you have at your location. And when you're, you're growing at that incredible pace, you know, you're just a, really a glutton for talent is the way I put it. You've got a lot of people hiring, a lot of new people coming in. It presents some incredibly interesting challenges. Um, luckily, I came into this field in the era of social 
you know, and the ability to leverage the crowd to really help you with your communications objectives. So uh, about a year and a half ago, I kind of felt like I hit my peak there at VMware. And I said, well, I love what I do, but I'm kind of bored. So I want to go do it somewhere else. And my next, uh, the company that came to mind was Salesforce.com. And a uh, very, very similar growth trajectory. Uh, sale, it's just a little bit about the company. Um, 13,000 employees. Uh, two years ago, we were 5,000 employees. So from 2,000 to 10,000 uh, in the last two years, and then almost 2,000 people acquired through our re most recent acquisition. You can imagine the uh, cultural chaos that ensues under these conditions. So I'm having a really great time there. Uh, my top priority is really staying up as we grow. Uh, we have an amazing secret sauce that's taken this company on an incredible ride. And so I think that we as communicators have this amazing voice that we can um, guide, nurture, and guide that culture. Culture just is. But I think every time one of our executives has something to say or we need to talk to our people, it's this great opportunity to just continually reinforce that culture. So I feel um, incredibly blessed to be in you know, my dream job doing this at Salesforce.com and uh, hope to share a few insights with you. So. Looking forward to it. So you talk about secret sauce, and I think you know our value is a piece of that sauce. And I'm really curious. You know, each of these companies is in the top 20, 25 best places to work, and probably you know definitely you know shows it by the way these women do internal comm and you know the participation there of you know, all the employees in the, in the programs. But I'm really curious about values. How are um, your corporate values showing up in your work? And what are the key corporate values for uh, yourselves and the employees? And do they match? Um, so I think I'll talk a little bit about, um, probably about five, six years ago, we kind of reinvented the company. Um, we had a new CEO come in. He launched a new strategy. And part of that was we redefined our values. So we didn't. Um, we didn't come up with a bunch of new ones, um, but we had, I think it was 10 kind of longer values. Um, and so they re-looked at, are these still our values as a company? We were a 25-year-old company at the time. And the way they did that wasn't ask the CEO and leadership team, but I think the way we developed these is how our values are. We engaged employees. And so literally there was a task force of, force of leaders that went out and just talked to employees. Who are we as a company? Who do you think we are? What words describe us? Um, and we created kind of nothing different than who we were, but one word values that really just defined who we are now. Um, and I think that's just who we are as a company. Um, and they were things like spirited and, and kind of these, instead of, you know, these long one sentences that no one could remember. Um, <laughs> and I think probably one of our biggest values and in, in how we see in internal comms, we play a big role, especially with our leaders, is just um, helping them connect with employees. Um, and when we redid our values and kind of reignited our company, we looked at everything we say and do internally and externally, and we had a whole campaign around our brand voice. And so we wanted that everything to be reflected of our values. Um, and so speaking in the, the language that people speak in, the corporate speak is gone. Um, and from everything from how our phone agents talk to how we do internal comms, and it kind of just changed the whole tone of our company. So it was, everything, it was kind of an everything we do, how do we reflect our values? And I think that's the first time we really stepped back and said, you know, one, who are we? Um, and it was who we are, not who do we strive to be one day or what do we want to be? Uh, and it came from the employees. And then it was reteaching everyone how to look at their job differently in, in, with those values. Thank you. So uh, NetApp has a value statement that is, in many ways, um, an aspirational statement. And it starts with our desire to be a model company. So it's, it's a goal that we have that we're always seeking after. We may attain success in, in many different ways, but that doesn't mean that we rest there. We need to keep um, growing, keep moving forward. And I'll tell you a little bit about the um, history of the values at NetApp. One of the things that's really important is that they're lived and they're not just talked. They are talked about, but it's really important to walk the talk as well. So at a time when the values were initially um, introduced, and this was before I joined the company, um, uh, not surprisingly, honesty and integrity are, are part of that um, statement of values. There was a um, potential customer who wanted um, bids on business that our folks determined um, was impossible to satisfy. 
and a competitor agreed to meet what the um, company wanted. And there was a conversation about how we should bid on that. And the group of people that was involved with that said, you know, if these values mean anything, then we can't say that we can do what we know we can't do. And so they didn't bid to accomplish what the company had asked in the time frame and all of that because they knew they couldn't meet that. And they didn't get the business. But the company which did bid and um, said it could meet these objectives wasn't able to do that. And so a year or so later, the business came back to NetApp. And that customer was a really loyal customer. So stories like that become part of the lore of the company, and they're shared. Um, they're shared uh, with new hires during a training that we have called Toast, Training on All Special Things. And uh, it's because when we started, our, um, our name was Network Appliance. The idea of the business was that um, the technology we created was as simple as a toaster. You could plug it in, and it would work. So we, we used some of those appliance metaphors in the early days. And we talk about, our CEO talks about the values with new hires, and there are examples of how they're lived. Every year we have an employee-driven um, contest where employees nominate their peers who are examples of living the values, and then they have a say in deciding who those peers are around the world, and we celebrate their stories and, and hear them at our annual All Hands. So there's a, a great emphasis on living the values and um, sharing stories of people doing that. From a comms perspective, Openness and candor are something that we support tremendously, and I think that one of the reasons NetApp um, has consistently been identified as a great place to work by the people who work there is because of that candor and that honesty and that directness. And we often share things with employees that we learn through survey data or anecdotes. People are not used to having um, a CEO or someone from the company share with them in terms of bookings and other information, but we share it because we're open with our employees, and we trust them to keep what's confidential confidential. So there's a, a great sense of openness and trust uh, that permeates the company. So for us, um, we're lucky to still have a founder CEO in place, which is nice, and that, that kind of definitely is a bedrock of the company. And when Mark built the company, um, he really embedded in the business model, what he hoped would become the values of the company. So Salesforce was founded on a new technology model, which I'm sure most of you know. Cloud. <laughs> now you can't turn on the, you know, any business show without hearing about the cloud, but you know, 14 years ago, that was something that the weatherman talked about only. So it's kind of <laughs> nice to know that that, but the cloud technology really was based on trust. You know, people said, Mark, was crazy. Mark Benham, you're a crazy person. People will not trust their customer data to a cloud situation. And um, so trust is our number one value based on that business model. Our, our second part of our business model that really feeds our values is customer success. Um, we are built on a subscription business model. Our customers don't have handcuffs on. It doesn't take 18 months to roll out our technology. You know, it's, it's a subscription basis and we have to renew their business every month. So that really builds this customer success value into our business. And I think the third one is probably the most important to me as a, as a culture cultivator. Um, you know, Mark Benioff was very, very successful at a young age, uh, had the pleasure of working with jo uh, Steve Jobs at Apple and kind of saw what it was like there and what Steve had cultivated there. And then, you know, Steve, after Steve was ousted, he went back and he saw the emptiness that was there. And, and I think it was an early lesson for him in how important culture was. And one of the things that he, uh, he was, then he was at Oracle for 10 years, you know, making money hand over fist, very, very successful, rose in the company, watched that company kind of go on a rocket ride. And at the end, of, at a young age, he's like, well, what's next? You know, what's next for me? And he took this crazy sabbatical, lived on a hut in the, on the beach in Hawaii and <laughs> swam with the dolphins, <laughs> rode around the Arabian Sea in rice boats. Um, went to India, met the Dalai Lama, but he also met this uh, saint called the Hugging Saint. Anyone from India in the room? Oh, darn, I can't say the name. It's like Mata Amritananda Mai. <laughs> and he credits her with this, this idea that you can do business while doing good. She really let him know, you don't have, he was like, do I make a choice? Do I now go a philanthropy road or do I stay professional? And 
she's like, why choose, right? <laughs> so best of both worlds. And that's really our third main company value, which is our 111 philanthropic model. And he likes to joke when he created the 111 model, you know, we didn't have any product, we didn't have any really any employees, and we didn't have any equity. So it was an easy decision to like put 1% of all that on the table. But um, today, you know, that's really a huge part of our company and a huge reason why people join Salesforce.com is that philanthropic value. Um, and I think the other twist there that probably came a little bit out of that same sabbatical is our aloha culture. And sometimes when people come in, they kind of mistake it for, we like to say it's not cheap Chinese plastic aloha. You know, it's not about grass skirts and coconuts and, you know, <laughs> Mai Tais. It's about that genuine, caring, hospitality, family, real aloha. So I'd say those are kind of our core values and they're deeply embedded in our business model. So we kind of have to live them or we fail, which is, is a good stake to put on the table when you're putting your values together. In terms of propagating them inside the company, um, we do, and um, again, with social being such a huge part of our culture, we have values badges, which are like for trust, customer success, all the things I just talked about. And our employees award each other and recognize the behaviors on a daily basis. You'll see like, hey, you know, way to, you know, I heard you did this volunteering event, one-on-one, -on -one, aloha spirit, you know. It's really, really cool we used to see the employees just giving each other a, not, a pat on the back for emulating that behavior. And actually in new hire orientation, we ask every employee to commit yourself, to be a champion, to be an evangelist of one of those values, you know, whether it's innovation or growth or aloha, whatever you want to choose. And um, that's been really powerful too. So there's a couple of ways we try to live the values. So I'm really curious in terms of culture Right? You talked a lot about that, Jennifer and Francesca, a little bit. But when I think of culture, I'm always like, who's in charge of culture? Right? And how do you kind of get the idea of what your culture is and then merge it in your communications uh, work? So to your question, who's in charge of culture? Everybody. So there's no one who owns culture. Um, Everyone has responsibility to include it in what they do and to live it. And like you were saying, if it's not being lived, call it out. Um, and so that's just the way we do things. Um, I, recently, I, I, I was talking, I sent an email to an executive about um, some behavior that we were seeing. And I said, you know, this isn't the culture. So it's totally right, you know, like, call it. And, and, and that's normal for people to do that. Oh, were you just, was that a question? Oh, OK. <laughs> Uh, so, so there, it's 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 everybody owns it now. From a comms perspective, I expect every communication to have something that touches our culture. It may not mention the culture, but it has to express it, and that way, it's it's just a constant. It's constantly reinforced. So, um, I was going to say, I mean, I think you know our culture is very similar. That um, if you, if if you aren't following the values and if the culture isn't a good fit, it's just not a good fit into it. And you see people who just, you either love it or it's just too foreign. Um, and so, and I think it's everybody. It's everybody's responsibility. Um, and I think with our leaders, it's just coaching them. You know, sometimes maybe they've been at other companies and come in. And that's, I think, where especially it takes a lot of coaching with them of, here's how we talk to our employees and here's how we interact with them. We're a big relationship-based company. And so, you know, all of the channels are great, but what works best is kind of the interaction and the relationship, all the, you know, starting at the top. And so, you know, I think every leader is expected, and our CEO does this regularly, of just sitting down with small groups of employees and talking to them. Um, you know, there's no more, you know, one way, here's our strategy, and listen to me for an hour and a half. There's a lot of discussion and interaction built, to hearing from the employees and just developing the relationship so there is that trust. Um, and so when there is a decision made or there's tough thing, you know, things that are being communicated, they have that trust, they have that relationship, they feel heard. And so I think um, you know, it's through the values and through you know, our leaders demonstrating it because they really set the tone. So. Yeah, I think you have to do more than provide and pray, I guess is what I would say. You, know, you definitely have to nurture and guide that culture. And when you ask who owns it, you know, I, I found coming into VMware, nobody, nobody really owned the nurture and guide part of it. <laughs> you know, if you don't, especially, and we're in a unique situation with this massive influx of people coming in, that we have to really define it. 
and and evangelize it. Otherwise, it gets really chaotic. So um, I think from a communications perspective, um, we've spent we've been kind of on a mission since I started there 16 months ago. The first prezo I built was for my boss to stand up in front of all of our executives and give them a come to Jesus on culture and how important culture was and how culture is our most valuable asset in the war for talent. And um, that was just her staking a claim saying this is important. This is actually the number one thing we're going to focus on as a talent organization, you know, and P.S. I'm not going to own it. You are, you know, you're going to be responsible for it. So it's kind of when I when one of the slides that we do when we talk about our culture is actually that asking people that question, you know, where are you focusing your energy when it comes to your talent strategy? You know, are you still in the 1.0 world where it's all about, you know, hire, onboard, manage, reward, develop? Or are you focusing on things like culture, capability, challenging your employees? You know, are you taking it to the next level? Because the, the big news is, is these are empowered employees. We all work in this valley, and we know how hard it is to attract and keep talent. We've got to take our game to the next level if we're going to meet those expectations of the empowered employees. And culture really is that, that weapon, I mean, that secret weapon and greatest asset. So that's the way we approach it. I just want to add one thing to that. One of the things that we've done is we have annual goals. And Many companies do, and culture, something relating to culture is usually one of those goals. Good. So everybody is, it's up front and center. Oh, I should be able to just like whip it off the top of my head, but it would be. So, so uh, I mean, well, if, in terms of um, the performance, when um, if we're looking at uh, performance reviews, so this is another area where culture permeates what we have, um, people, everyone every year goes through a, a focal process of uh, reviews of how they're doing um, their job. And one is, you know, what have you done? You know, have you met your goals or met the goals that changed? And the other is, how did you meet those goals? And um, part of that process is a kind of a 360 where everyone gives some names of people that they would like to have comment on their work. And typically, the question that will come from a manager to the people that they're asking input on someone's performance includes you know, how they're living the values. So that is something which is just part of the performance process um, every year. What are you held account? Because I mean, we're very metrics driven when it comes to delivering results. So I have to prove that all this energy I'm putting into culture building is actually having an impact. Um, so one of the big measures we use actually is how we stack up against our talent competitors and things like great places to work. That's two thirds of that score is based on your employees opinions of you. So you really can't game it that much, <laughs> which is great, you know, because it is a great barometer and, and you know, measuring how you measure up against the 100 best other companies as well is a great measurement for companies. We also um, set some like activity-based goals around, our, we challenged our executives whenever you travel to bring the employees together. We call them executive town halls and um, that has been a great success. But you know, the first quarter was kind of slow and Mark Benioff kicked a note off to all his directs with the list of who was talking to our people. And he said, look who's talking to our people, dot, 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 and who isn't. <laughs> You know, and boom, next quarter, I have a lot more town hall requests, you know? <laughs> so, and these are not um, functional town halls. These are listening sessions. They are 90% Q&A with, with the employees. It's fantastic. It's like employees show up and they expect to sit in a room like this and be, you know, talk to like that. And it's like, nope, actually, we're here to listen to you. What's on your minds? Let's talk. And you, they, the sessions go 90 minutes. We have to cut it off. Their employees are so hungry for that face-to-face -face interaction. They're usually between 50 and like 200 employees in a room with the CEO, the COO, the CFO, it's very, very powerful. So you had talked about values and spirited, Sarah, and I'm wondering how that shows up with your executives. Do you have any spirited executives? Well, I mean, I think our CEO, and I was telling you a little earlier, um, he is, he's the model I was telling her is every communications dream. And so I think he is just a very real person. And he always talks about he's from West Virginia. He's just a country boy. He's your average person. You know, the way he communicates is through giving analogies of movies and everything that people can relate to. And he's the kind of person you watch and you want to follow. And just his whole energy, whether it's in a small meeting or in you know, a large company forum, he's always kind of having fun and he's always just relatable. 
he's not the executive kind of over in the office. And he, I don't know how long he's been with Intuit, probably eight years or so, but he's had different roles. So he's gotten to know, and the minute you meet him, he always knows who you are. And he says hi in the hallway, and he stops and has a conversation. And you know, I think it just starts with him. Um, and I'd say he's a role model for our leaders, and it's tough because you work for leaders who look at him and say, but I'm not as good as him. And you know, they all have their different personalities and their different strengths, and it's kind of like you never will be him. I mean, he's, you know, but how, I think it's how do they each in their individual ways kind of bring that culture to, to the company. Well, so from values and culture, I want to talk about what you all do and what some really best practices and some innovative programs you've had, particularly in communicating strategy. So I'm just curious, what are, what are some things that you've been doing that have really been working? And let's start with Jennifer. So we've kind of, you know, in the social world, stories are the currency, obviously. And, and I think, you know, the storytelling has really, we've really kicked that up a lot. Um, the, the second piece that I think is a big part of our strategy is we've really moved away from comms to like pitching with our employees. I think that um, we're in a very crowded information marketplace. And when I um, interviewed at Salesforce, he was like, what's the value of what you do? And I said, it's, it's to get mindshare in this crazy, I have 500 emails in my inbox world, you know, <laughs> how do you, how do you get that? So I think, you know, one thing that we've, I'm fortunate we're getting at Salesforce is it's a sales and marketing culture. And so there's some some of the best marketers in the world and learning from, I just watch what, how they pitch our products. I'm selling a product too. The product is dream job, you know, and every program we have, every service we offer the employees, is just another feature benefit that we can kick out there and pitch with our people. Um, always with transparency, authenticity, but it's just getting their attention, you know, doing more than informing. I think we do a lot of communication that's like, just like talking, informing and not so much like, telling people why it matters, why you should care, why you should engage with this program. And even if they don't use the program, at least then they have this perception that you're doing something awesome for them and you're wrapping your arms around them. So I think that's a big shift for me is just less comms, more like understanding I got to pitch if I want their attention. So. so in terms of communicating strategy, corporate direction, we um, use the typical things that you would expect uh, having our CEO talk about things in our corporate all hands emails, videos, but I think one of the most powerful is when we, um, as you were describing, put our executives on the road. And so we put uh, 27, 26 of our executives on the road and they met with employees in 26 cities around the world. And most of the time they were in um, pairs of executives so they could answer questions. They had materials that were prepared. And from a comms perspective, um, we provided them with speaking points so that they could open up a session. We provided them with extensive FAQs. And then we also insisted that there be a comms person who traveled with them who would take notes on the questions and answers. And if there was something that wasn't um, answered or that was still up in the air, could communicate back to the comms team that was uh, back at headquarters and figure out what is the best answer for that so that we could provide those answers on the fly. And then we took all of the, um, the notes and feedback on each of the sessions and prepared a summary of that for the execs so that they could look at what were the topics that came up, what was important, what do people want to hear more about, as you were saying, lots of questions, and then looking at how we shape our communications months out from that to respond to those questions, to respond to those areas of interest. And uh, it, was, it was very eye-opening for the execs. Some of them hadn't been out for a while, and it was really good for them to see how hungry the employees were to talk with them and how they really could have spent much more time in each location than they did. And so what was interesting is they came back saying, we want to do this on a regular basis. And they were um, really wanting to hold themselves accountable for doing more work like this. So it was very eye-opening. I think it's really powerful. It's not an easy thing to orchestrate, but it's worth all the effort that it takes. Um, so I'll talk about two things. I think one thing that, um, you know, we have kind of our normal OPMEX. We start off the fiscal year, there's a leadership meeting, and we kind of have normal OPMEX. And what we did about five years ago is said, this leadership meeting where the CEO talks about our new strategy for the year, why is that closed? Why can't every employee watch that? Um, and this year, I think it's about the fifth year they've done it. It's literally everything's broadcasted. 
and teams get together in different rooms and even the exercises that the leaders are doing in the room, it's directors and above, but you can you know, download stuff online or participate that way. So I think there's less kind of let's only tell the secret group um, and let's tell the whole company at once. Um, and then our CEO hits the road and now that everyone's kind of grounded on the strategy, he hits, he, I think, our top 25 sites and just does open town halls. So it's kind of follow up from that. So I think that's how he sets the stage with the company. One of the things we experimented with this, uh, with this year is gamification. And so one of the key things um, our CEO felt like we, we didn't have a good eye on our, comp our competition across the company. And so we worked with a third party who literally built kind of an app where there were different things that you had to, as an employee, you could read an article or um, go check out a website and you got points and it was this whole point system and you could see the top 10 and you saw our executives doing it. So you saw the CEO in the top 10 at one point. And so it was this whole idea of like, you know, uh, the competitiveness, I think, but a, a way to just, you know, can we entice people to learn in different ways? Um, and they ended up having actually great results. You know, our normal articles in our company news channel compared to kind of having this reason to go there and push to go there for di for all different reasons and it, it was good results for us so wow, there's a lot of involvement of the employees at each of your organizations I'm really really impressed and I'm sure with involvement comes some challenges right a lot of uh, trust also with the employees and the executives. I'm really seeing that, especially with, um, I know Jennifer, you also have open leadership meetings, right? Yeah, we do the same thing. Yeah, so that's something that's kind of new. So tell us what are some of, the, some of the biggest mistakes that the communications group has ever made so we can all never do that again. <laughs> uh, well, I'll start with one. Um, we introduced social media to NetApp uh, because we felt that it was really important for um, our employees to learn to be more social. Um, the, the world is changing and don't have a sense of who's going to win, but we felt that we really needed to do that. And more than one group <coughs> introduced um, more than one platform. So that result has been um, some confusion. We have multiple social platforms. Um, but the intent was right. The other thing that we learned in doing this is if you have a pain point somewhere in the company, sometimes when you introduce something else, it will go and fill that pain point. So when we brought social media, um, that platform in, it was so much easier to publish on that than on a regular intranet that it became used as kind of a de facto intranet because people who didn't have a webmaster, so we weren't really using the right technology for the right purpose. It was being used because it was available. It was easy to, easier to use as a producer of content, not necessarily easier for the consumers of content. So uh, you know, it was something that we tried, and I still I think we would probably try it again, because I think it's better to try something and learn lessons than not try it. No other mistakes. <laughs> There's lots of tech, technology uh, infrastructure issues at Salesforce that I won't talk about that cause all kinds of crazy errors. Like we just switched to Gmail and I think one of my um, most uncomfortable evenings was when I sent my first all hands invite via Gmail and it caused bounce backs into everybody's mailboxes and I got a uh, call from the EA of the founder, Parker Harris, the other founder. Parker's inbox is blowing up, with, and then they started flooding in from all over the company. So yeah, lots of lots of fun technology errors that are pretty crazy. But I I kind of agree with Francesca. I think um, when you introduce your enterprise social network within your company, uh, you also do need that place for the sense of permanency and kind of the this is the right information, the real you know the official word. Because I think that we go a little crazy on the social, and I think at Salesforce prior to my joining there. Um, they just said, well, the internet doesn't matter anymore, and they kind of went the other way, and it's all social, but I think now we're kind of coming back around to this place where, you know, it is kind of nice to have a permanent place to talk to employees and, and where people can find the definitive answer and whatnot. So just making sure that uh, your enterprise social network isn't, uh, it's not this or that, it's the right tool for the right purpose. You know, whether it's email, whether it's enterprise social network, or whether it's the intranet, there's multiple communication vehicles and that you're using them all wisely. So I think similar along the lines, I mean, I think 
um, a lot of times we look at that these technology channels will solve the problem. Um, and well, we identified it, so it should, you know, it'll it'll be great. Why aren't you using it? And I think you have to let the culture drive some of that. And you know, I remember like however many years ago we introduced just chat, and it took a long time. And it wasn't a when you try to mandate it from a communications perspective or no you drive people from a communications <coughs> perspective, they're resistant versus they have a need and they see that this is the solution or this is the right channel. Um, and I think just the other thing is given I'm in technology communication and Jackie's here who helps drive a lot of this for us is if the technology doesn't work, if the channel doesn't work, um, you lose people completely. And to get people back to a place of wanting to use whatever that channel is, is a really hard road. And I think um, we this year, um, we're kind of just growing into more of a global company um, and we realized we had very old video conferencing capabilities and we're a relationship company so flying to San Diego for the day was like driving into Mountain View to go to work um, and we said you know technology can solve this but we introduced technology it was too soon and it didn't work and we're now you know a year later trying to fix that problem it's a great communication tool for teams to interact and feel like they're in the same room. And we had all these grand ideas of 17 other ones, but we're just trying to get past the first one because we launched it too soon and it didn't work. Um, and so trying to rebuild the brand of some of these channels. Um, and it's, you know, I think just making sure that they're really ready and there's really a need and not trying to force them on people. You can't just change their behaviors. Um, and so providing the solutions and, and guiding them, but not forcing it upon people. So we we're kind of talking about video a little bit, and Francesca is really curious about streaming video. I think that you launched streaming video at NetApp, I, I did. and I want to hear about that and how it's impacted the um, employees there. So we launched streaming video um, probably 13 years ago. So uh, when I joined NetApp, we had a product which supported um, streaming video. And I helped our CEO um, prepare for uh, an all-hands meeting. And afterwards, he basically said, I think we should be doing this on you know, ourselves. There must be a way we can do this. And basically challenged me to make this happen. And um, sometimes you know, fools go where angels fear to tread. So I was like, OK. <laughs> and I talked to our CIO, and I um, talked with other people. And we determined, yes, we could, in fact, do this um, by the next quarter. However, it would require that we suspend almost every other program that we had that would <laughs> require IT support. So we went back to the CEO and kind of told him we, we could do it, and this is what it would take. And uh, what we ended up uh, deciding, he um, brought the topic to his table, and um, they decided, obviously, not to do it right away. But we, we did launch um, streaming video within about six months of that time, and we had T1 lines coming into Great America for our all hands meetings. And um, in terms of mistakes, fortunately, there were no after effects of this, but I had no idea what was involved with testing a system. So I remember telling our IT guys to just go ahead and test this with no idea that if it hadn't worked, it could have broke down our network. Um, but fortunately, everything worked. And uh, so we started to stream our all hands meetings um, at that time. And it was really powerful because. We had very small employee bases in other countries, and they really felt connected to the company. And so we got rid of all of the videotapes of um, all hands that were mailed out and would get there two to three weeks late when they were really out of date. And from that point on, um, our meetings have always been live, um, whether it's live streaming or live in, in a room. And uh, then we've also, because of we have employees around the world, and people are working 24 hours a day, we um, post those videos. So we have um, video on demand within a couple of hours of those meetings. So employees can watch it either as a team or at their leisure um, within hours of when it, the meetings actually happen. So Jennifer, I really like the idea of selling a dream job. <laughs> And um, I'm curious, because I think you have probably made a pretty young employee base. So how are you finding like collaboration and the social world really impacting executives? It's 
So you mean, what is it like to have like all these empowered young millennials running around with high demands and giving my dream, your, we have a joke, I got your dream job right here, you know? <laughs> so um, I think that it is a huge challenge for the executives and that's why getting on board with this idea that, you know, you're not in control anymore, I think is a big thing for people to grasp and that, you know, when you do let go, something beautiful happens, the crowd really takes over and actually they're pretty good at taking care of themselves and, you know, collaborating. I think, I, you know, a big part of our culture, we like to say Salesforce is a team sport. And um, I think that the executives play the team sport too. We, this company storms around opportunities like nothing I've ever seen and challenges. When something goes wrong, I mean, we are on it. And I think it's a big part of our success is this team sport. And I think the social, the chatter, that early chatter adoption and it being so pervasive within our business, you know, has been a huge part of our ability to storm. But I also think it's a huge part of meeting the expectations of employees because they use chatter to kind of really connect with other people who share their interests, who work on like projects and share best practice. There's a like huge connectivity factor there. Um, how many of you have a really robust enterprise social network going within your company right now? One that people are all on board. Well, don't be, no, don't worry because, you know, enterprise social is really only three years old. It's still pretty new and people are just getting their arms around it. But I mean, it is a game changer. And I think, so like having chatter or jive or yammer that everyone in the company, like a true, you, you have actually own an instance and manage and administrate an instance. I think they have to learn how to flex the muscle and how to, how to do it. And I think, you know, especially over the last few years, you see your grandparents on Facebook and, you know, your your mom finally joined LinkedIn and, you know, all these things. So I, I do think it's coming and I think it's a fundamentally better way to do certain tasks. Um, just like I said, it doesn't replace everything. It's, it's just another tool in the toolkit, but it's an extremely powerful tool. I mean, we've just, we do surveys of our customers. Obviously, Chatter is one of our products and people say they get about a 39% increase in information sharing a 34% increase in engagement, and about a 30% decrease in emails and meetings, which means you know people have learned to flex the muscle and use a new tool. I mean, think about it when the phone, you know, when it went from phone to email. I mean, that's a long transition period. So we're just kind of in the infancy. But uh, just to give you an inspirational anecdote, uh, three w when I was first at VMware, I was super passionate about enterprise social before there even was a chatter. This is like 2007, 2008 when there was just jive pretty much, and IBM had a product as well. And, you know, people made fun of me because I fought for it so hard for so long. And they're like, how's that enterprise social network thing going? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and I just called it my Don Quixote quest. And I said, I'm going to stay on this. I'm going to stay on this until we have it. And um, three years into the process, we bought a company called Socialcast, which is a competitor of Chatter. It was the ultimate validation <laughs> that it was the future, you know, and, um, so if you haven't gone down that road as communicators, I mean, I just think it's like no, you have to champion it and just be a real advocate of it. And, and once you do get it, you have to nurture and guide it. You can't just drop it out there and, you know, expect people to know how to use it. You got to put the, I call them the gateway groups, things like FemForce or Outforce, you know, our employee resource groups on there. People get kind of used to associating, or like the Chicago hub, you know, people join around a, a non-work related topic a lot but then they learn the muscle and guess what? Pretty soon they're managing projects and they're you know, giving feedback and they're using it to communicate for work. So anyways, that's just, that's my two cents. That's my soapbox. Thanks for letting me preach. <laughs> and I'd just like to weigh in on that a little bit. It, we were really early adopters of Jive as well and it was really the bleeding edge of technology. And what's great is to see that while this is still a nascent kind of communication, it's not the bleeding edge that it was a few years ago. It's really, it's matured. So Sarah had an interesting use of Facebook in India. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So I think our dream would be to be where Jennifer is, but we just haven't seen, we have Yammer at our company, and I think um, some of the behaviors we see, there's a lot of lurkers. So we know people are seeing, but they're not necessarily posting and commenting. I think for us, especially in technology communications, it's a great way for us to see feedback from our customers, which are employees. And so we've actually, in communications, been able to add that value to our business units of just kind of know, and we act like PR people. We're out there like, 
intercepting with our customers, pointing them to what the facts are, um, and even started an advisory board of kind of uh, people that do uh, post a lot in their social channels and influencing them and educating them so they're on our team as opposed to kind of out there questioning. Um, what we, what uh, we hired a communications manager um, in India probably about a year and a half ago and instead of kind of pushing the internal channel, he looked and said, well, everyone's on Facebook. Everyone, everyone's in social. They're just not in social where we want them to be. And so he started a India, um, Intuit India Facebook page. And it is like their number one channel for communications. Um, and you know the culture there is a little different, and so they're big on rewards and recognition, and and there's he it's you know a big part of what he does and what the team does, and there's tons of comments and likes, and it's not it's not a private group. You don't have to be it into it, and so it's also a great way to attract talent as well. And so I think it's just leveraging where people are from a social perspective and going to where they are as opposed to forcing them to come where we want them to be. And, um, you know, we've thought about, especially in the engineering community, does that work with engineers? And so do we try that in the U.S.? And would that work? Um, but I think we have about 800 to 1,000 employees in India, and um, it's been a great success for them. And posting videos, post, you know, there's, I, I think it's you have to trust your employees. You know, they're not going to put stuff, they're not going to put code out there for the new product, you know, and so, uh, but it's been a great way for them to kind of really rally, um, as a, especially from a location that used to kind of be very small and feel not, not connected, because um, we have kind of every business unit and function there. We haven't had any issues with it. You know, it's been, I'd say it's been running for about a year. Um, and I think, you know, uh, there's someone who has the full access and owns the page and from a corporate communications perspective. Um, but they haven't seen, they haven't had any issues with it. I think you know, he has some guidelines he runs it by, and if he sees something, you know, maybe there is stuff in the background that he's doing of taking stuff off or contacting people, but um, there haven't been any issues with it, so, or they don't know about it. <laughs> well, that example is really interesting um, in terms of internal and external lines kind of blurring, and I'm wondering if you've had any um, examples of, you know, external internal issues with um you know we're talking about trust a little bit anything that you know are your best practices with employees in terms of confidentiality of information particularly on the social um, spheres so it's not something that we've really had problems with um, but we are very conscious of, of training to pick up on that question about what does legal approve. When we um, first ventured into social, even having um, much more social presence internally, we put together this enormous um, like 28-page guidelines for using social because we had HR and, <laughs> and legal that, that weighed in on that. But over time, that's evolved. And um, our current uh, general counsel uses um, Inter, you know, our internal social media platforms to blog and communicate with the legal team. It's, it's closed just for their community, but they're using social within their team. And our current um, guidelines for social, uh, you could show on a, a PowerPoint, they hyperlink to other things, but language that I includes like, don't be a jerk. I mean, really, stuff that reflects our values about don't leak, um, further something, um, really that reflect, how do you want, what's your brand that you want to have internally and externally? You want something that's going to reflect positively on you as well as on the company. So we have guidelines to that effect and we have um, both in-person and online, so, um, you know, kind of on-demand uh, social media training that we're providing. And, and to speak to that kind of line of blurring between the internal and external communications, um, NetApp is a B2B company. And we've uh, launched a, um, an ambassador program for our, our employees, which is really about increasing our external awareness. And uh, this is something that my team has been doing, and we've been talking with employees over the last year to get their feedback on what they wanted, to your idea about crowdsourcing, what's the information that they need, what's the way that it's useful for them to get it, um, putting that together. And then part of what we do when we talk about this program is we introduce high level the social engagement rules. So those people who are on social or want to be social um, know what those rules are from, from a company perspective. And then we make it easy for people to know what they can and can't share so that it, 
it's clear what's in, under NDA, what's confidential and what's public. And we encourage people, you know, if you have a doubt about what it is, then pub, you know, publish something that's public, some, a press release, an article, something that's already out in the public. And if you are going to err on one side or the other, err on the side of keeping things quiet, particularly if you're in a technical role. And you know, it's, it's really common sense, and it's a combination of providing people with assets that they can use, and then on an ongoing basis, giving them refreshed assets that they can use. We're doing, we're doing really all the same things, you know, having that employee ambassador program. What I, what I think is interesting too, though, is the idea of like ecosystem communications. And, you know, when you're talking about storytelling and in your employer brand, I don't know if anyone's in recruitment marketing or any, anybody in here doing that work at all, or is it all com most com mostly comms? But yeah, I, I like to repurpose stuff that gets published outside the company, inside the company. I think we assume our employees like read our website and our press releases and the news about us. So I think recycling that back inside is really healthy. I think we do a ton of cycling outside as well of our employee stories and kind of what's going on with our culture. We, we float about three pieces of content a week up to our corporate social team about our culture and our people and they publish them and they get crazy engagement. Sometimes they're some of the highest clicked on and liked things on our on our Facebook. So people are curious about your culture. They want to know what's going on inside your company. Your culture is your face externally. So for me, you know, well, that's my number one communication value is ecosystem. You know, great content. Push it inside and out. Well, recently we opened a new office in like Hillsboro, Oregon, and putting out um, the celebration of the opening day photos. It had some really cool, funky stuff, and people went crazy for that. <laughs> Um, a lot of times we'll put up stories, like we recently had an amazing intern story of someone from Europe who came through the Europe program and is now working on our onboarding boot camp team, you know, so in sto stories about your people, about your workplace, about your culture, people want to know who your face is, you know, in the social world, Intuit doesn't cut it, they want to know who Intuit is, how can I relate to it, so I think having that uh, culture content getting pushed outside, and again, the corporate team isn't going to do that. You know, they don't look for it. They don't produce it. And, and that's a real win for us. I mean, it really gives high visibility to our internal comms efforts when we can put up a story like that on the board and have it get really good engagement. So we're talking about stories. And I'm curious, in terms of your executives, we talked a little bit about face-to-face. But I'm wondering how else um, executives are getting really involved in the social world or not. Uh, well, I'm I think we're on an, uh, the spectrum of they're not very involved. Um, I think our CEO has been very getting very involved in LinkedIn and what we've seen as far as um, what that's done for his brand and him the brand of the company. Um, and I'd say it's an area that we um, are continuing to try to push our executives. Um, but I don't think it's something that we've nailed, nor would I say, you know, we're 100% successful. Um, and I think we just constantly look for where's, and where are people comfortable? So I think you can't force them, right? You know, I, I mean, I remember years ago, like blogs, and, and they said, cool, I'll have a blog, like, what are you writing for me? And it was like, no, this is where we, you know, and so I think too, it's executive by executive, and we have some leaders that have, you know, blogs have been great, and they can actually feel like they can talk to employees, and express real things and um, but I'd say you know I think from an internal and external pr uh, perspective it's it's still an area that we continue to try to um, push and, and figure out where does it make sense um, so. so we're in a similar situation I look at it this way an executive has a platform which is the content that he or she wants to speak to and they have media that they're comfortable with and so you want to um, have that combination that they're comfortable with we have a couple of people who are active in social, our vice chairman, Tom Mendoza, tweets and has lots and lots of followers. Um, but he's the exception. But that's what he's comfortable with. Other people are comfortable with other medium. Yeah, so um, Mark Benioff, I think he was voted the most social CEO <laughs> in business. So uh, we have a very, very social CEO, both inside and outside the company, which you know is good and, and bad sometimes, but it's good most of the time. Um, and most of our executives, I think one of the most interesting ways that our executives got engaged in the social platform is a very, very popular group we have called Airing of Grievances on our internal social network. And 
you know, the executives, they troll that group, man. If they if something's on that group about one of their, like, that has to do with something they're supposed to be providing for employees or, or something that's slowing the business down, they're on there and they're responding and they're like, you know, at mentioning, you know, Joe, get on this, you know? <laughs> so if there's things that, it's really wonderful to see if there's things that are slowing the business down or just making people unhappy, that we have a place for them to vent. And um, we actually pulled the data from that to understand what we could do to make the business move faster. You know, what is in our employees' ways? You know, everyone wants to get their work done. What's in the way of them getting their work done or, or being happy at work? And uh, that group was actually, I think, a big engagement point because it's curiosity. I think they love to go in there and see what's on there and that they just got really engaged with it. Um, I think that one executive story that I thought was pretty funny was when uh, we're doing something I call a crowd storm where you do an online um, talk with your employees. It's, it's like a, ta it's a threaded chat like you do on Facebook or whatever. And I, I talked the EVP of sales into doing one of these. And he actually showed up at the meeting without a computer. <laughs> so if that gives you a sense, I'm sure some of you can relate to that for your executives. <laughs> This, the second participant in the chat showed up with a computer that was like on Internet Explorer 3.0. And I'm like, okay, I'm guessing you all don't engage too often with your computers or with social, so let's get back to remedial. But that executive, very interestingly, you know, he got in and he was freaking out. It's all online. There's no, there's no video. There's no phone. I, your employees are just asking you questions and you're answering. And, and my, the VP of HR talked him into it because she was doing it. And she was answering about 60 employee questions from all over the world in like a 30-minute session. It was fantastic. And he got excited to do it. And he did it. And he, he was like, do I push hit? Do I, I'm just hit it, hit it like the whole time. I'm just right and hit, right and hit. And so anyways, uh, after that, he finally acquiesced to getting engaged with social. And his first post, uh, he got no engagement, really. But I said, you had your comms person write this. It sounds like a corporate memo. And you've been talking at people for over seven years and not listening. So I urge you to please get human, get talking, and your people will engage with you. And guess what? He started just putting micro chats in and people started, and all of a sudden he's getting all these likes and all these comments and he's getting all this valuable information from his employees and he got really engaged. But, but you know, it was funny. At first I think he was like, he, like I said, he showed up without a computer for an online chat. I mean, it just kind of tells you where a lot of executives' heads are at. They're, they're not quite in the game yet. But once they get engaged, they just get, on, they get so curious. I mean, they're just like, this is like crazy access to talking to people and just engaging real time. So it's pretty fun. <laughs> It's a fun evolution if you're a comms person. It's fun to watch. I know Catch is going to wrap up, but I just want to say thank you so much. This is very humanizing and very inspiring. Each of you are doing fabulous work. Fabulous. Thank you.